Please be seated. And we welcome back our guest speaker today, Chuck Green. Chuck. Well, I'm back. Uh, some of you might not remember me. Uh, I was here a few weeks before Easter. Uh, I'll give you a quick summary of who I am um, before I start the sermon. It's always nice to know the person you're who's actually uh, presenting the word for the day. Um, I'm a neg native Pittsburgher. Um, I tell people um, you can't get more burger head than me. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Steelers of the 70s, married a Pittsburgh girl, went to school in Pittsburgh at CCAC on the north side and Robert Morris. I've just um, always been a Pittsburgh guy, live in Pittsburgh currently, um, so uh, raised a family in Pittsburgh, uh, uh, just love being a Pittsburgher, proud of being a Pittsburgher. I work for a European company and, and they always laugh, they're, they're like, Chuck really likes Pittsburgh, he'll never leave and uh, um, I hope to never leave. So um, I um, also, uh, uh, raised a family here in Pittsburgh, and I also went to Liberty University. That's where I did my seminary degree. And uh, I feel right, I fill in uh, occasionally uh, for pulpit supply, like I do. Uh, I've done that, uh, probably preach. I end up preaching probably like uh, 10 to 15 times a year. So it's really a privilege when I get to come see new faces and share, share God's word. We're actually going to be in John chapter 14 today, John chapter 14. Um, for those who were here the last time I was here, this is kind of part two of that message. I know there's been a long gap, <laughs> but I'm not in control of the gap. So <laughs> I'll give you the uh, conclusion of uh, part one. And if you recall, for those who were here before, um, when I looked in John chapter 13, we, we looked at Jesus right before the crucifixion. Uh, th these are his last hours, his last 24-hour period. And that's a big period in the Gospel of John. When you look at John chapters 13 all the way up through 19, which is like 30% of the full Gospel of John, it represents like a 24-hour period of time. That's a You know, when we look in, in the Bible sometimes in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you go five and six chapters, you're, you're, you're talking about years sometimes. But in these five chapters, which make up a big chunk of the Gospel of John, you're looking at a 24-hour period of time. And we started looking at that in John chapter 13 when we were here last time, when Jesus washed the apostles' feet. And we talked about servanthood, and we talked about the cleansing ministry of Jesus Christ. But he said something in, in John chapter 13. He, he shocked them. And remember, he's, he's not... He's not on the Sermon of the Mount teaching to 5,000 people. He is teaching right now in John chapter 14 to his intimate, close apostles. Those few people who have followed him from the beginning. And now he says, I'm going away. And their, their hearts are in turmoil. They're, they're so distressed. And he also said one of them is going to betray him, Judas. So what they know is their life is going to change. And Jesus knows they have one of those events in their life where it like takes their feet from underneath them. I think we've all had those events where maybe we got a phone call or there was a conversation or we heard something, and we knew that our life was going to change. And it was causing a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. And they knew, he said he was going away, and they didn't fully comprehend that. But what they knew, and what Jesus knew, is they were in turmoil. And oftentimes, many times, it's when you look at Scripture, understanding what the people were thinking and what they're feeling at that time 
is really the key to understanding the message that the author is giving and what Jesus is giving. I had a friend, and this is not a betrayal of any confidence. He, he uses this as a ministry. He spoke, he's spoken about this particular event in his life uh, many times um, in front of many different believers, churches, and men's groups. And I would say he's, he's a top 10 friend of mine. And we were away on a weekend, and he said to me, he said, Chuck, I have it all. I, I said, what are you talking about you have it all? He goes, I got Jesus in my heart. He goes, I got a wife at home that loves me. I just had a new baby girl, and he, I got my two boys, and I, I, I have a job I love. I got my health. I don't know how anyone could be any happier than I am right now. And I'm with my guys. We were, you know, we were having a, a, a man's weekend, and he's like, I'm with my guys, and everything's good, and we were catching fish, and we were just eating lots of food and barbecue and chocolate chip cookies. And, and then that weekend, he went home, and his wife said, I, I have to talk to you. I'm leaving. I hooked up with my old boyfriend on Facebook, and I'm not coming back to this house. That happened in a 24-hour period of time. And Jesus kind of delivered a message like that that he was leaving, but now he was, he was coming back. But it tells you a little bit how they were feeling, that how they were in unbelievable turmoil. What, what do you mean you're leaving? You've been with us for three and a half years. You know, Peter said you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Look, what do you mean you're leaving? You know, you're the Messiah. You're the king. What do you mean you're leaving? And Je Jesus has to address their troubled heart. Uh, and in our life, we, in our life, we will have troubled hearts. I don't know what it will be. It, it'll be different for every person. Every person walks a different path, but we will have troubled lives. And look what Jesus said with that backdrop. Verse four, chapter 14, verse 1, John he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the power in it. And I just pray in these moments that we have that you would guide my thoughts, my, my words. And I just pray that the hearts um, in this body would be open uh, to receiving what your spirit has for it. And I just pray that it would touch um, and give each person what they need, whether it's encouragement or salvation or grace or mercy, whatever it might be that they need to build your kingdom, I pray that that would be accomplished today. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So he said, let not your heart be troubled. An easy thing, you know. Did, did, were you ever troubled and someone said, don't worry about it? And you're like, how, how, what do you mean don't worry about it? <laughs> it's a big thing. But Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. See, the apostles believed in God. They, they trusted the God of the Old Testament. They, they knew God created man. They knew he saved the nation of Israel. He protected, he brought them out of Egypt in bondage. He took care of them in the desert. He provided manna, food. He provided guidance, a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. But Jesus said, you know what? You believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus is trustworthy. His words are trustworthy. He says, 
you can believe and follow me. When I think about everything that Jesus did, how he left heaven and became a man and walked the face of the earth, I, I, that, when you think about that, he left heaven for us. And he took care. He taught the apostles. He guided them. He watched over them. He protected them. And ultimately, he's trustworthy because it, in that Garden of Gethsemane, his human personhood did not want to go to the cross. But he obeyed. He was worthy of our trust. Over and over again, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Let it pass from me. Who would want to be crucified? But he obeyed the Father, and he provided for us. So we can trust in Jesus to meet our need, whatever it might be, whenever it might be, wherever it might be. And I, so we can draw comfort in that we can trust him. The second thing we can draw comfort is found in verse 2. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. I love the fact that he goes and prepares a place for us. Many times in that culture of that time, when, when a man's son would get married, he would ex potentially expand the home or a place an added dwelling onto the home where his son and new bride could come. And I love that God is preparing a place for us. Uh, he's a great preparer. I've, I've used this. When he made the earth, he prepared it for us. It has the perfect temperature. It has everything we need to to be sustained. And the greatest thing when he prepared the earth is there is food everywhere. Everywhere there is food. There's seafood. There's animals. There's vegetables. There's, I, I walked out in my backyard. I bought a new house. And, and, and there's, there's cherry trees just there. And there's food falling off. And he has prepared a place for us. A place and when you think about a place, a place is an amazing thing to have. Uh, the other day, I went to my parents' house, and I called my dad, and I said, um, you guys going to be home? And he says, no, we're not going to be home for like another half hour. I said, well, I'll stop, and I'll wait for you. And now, I can't just do this in any, anyone's house, right? I, I, I got there. I have a I have a key to their house, and I walked in. I can't just walk into anyone's house. It, it's not my home, but there's a place for me in that house. And I walked into that house, and I was comfortable walking into that place. And I had just been working out in the yard, and I was really thirsty. And I went to the refrigerator, and they had a fresh cut watermelon. And there's a place for me there. So I cut me a big slab. I, di I didn't ask anyone. I cut a big slab off, and I sat down, and I sat there, and I ate it. And then I was like, you know, mom and dad usually have ice cream. <laughs> it, that's the great, great thing about a place. You know where everything is. I knew exactly in the freezer upper right hand corner is where the ice cream is and I walked in there and I got my Eskimo pie and I sat down and I waited for my parents to come home and I was laying on the couch when they walked in now I cannot do that 
just in any old house, right? I can't just say, oh, there's a house. I'm just going to go in there and eat watermelon and Eskimo pie and like take a nap on the couch, right? I can't do that. But in their home, I have a place. There's a place for me. You know what my dad said when he got home? He goes, if you want more watermelon and another Eskimo pie, go ahead, eat it. Why? Because I have a place. There's a place. And when Jesus says, not only can you trust me, not only am I preparing, but you have a place with me. Think about that. You have a place with the resurrected Christ and the creator of the universe. Think about that. You have a place with the resurrected Christ and the creator of the universe. I don't know what that place is going to look like, but I bet it's pretty amazing because Jesus died, what, 2,000 years ago? And he's had 2,000 years in our linear time to prepare this place for us. When you start thinking about these things, it brings the turmoils of life into perspective. We can trust him. We have a prepared place and he is coming again for us. And he has proven himself trustworthy because he took the walk to the cross and obeyed the Father and died for our sins so that we might have life, so we might have this prepared place. He can be trusted. And I love what Jesus said too. He continues with helping their soul in turmoil, with their hearts in turmoil. In verse 4, he says, because they want to know where he's going, right? He said he, in, in chapter 3, he's going away. So in John chapter 14, verse 4, in the next verses, he says, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, and this is a verse we all know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not only do we have our, the ability to trust him, not only is there a prepared, prepared place for us, he has shown us the way in the personhood of Christ, in following Christ. I'm glad that we don't live in a world where we don't know who the answer is. Uh, there's nothing worse than being lost. Uh, one time I went on a trip, uh, and it was a business trip, and there was a young man in the office. And... Um, I was looking for a ride to one of our plants in a facility. It was probably like three hours away. And he says, you know, I, I, I was, he, was, he was really young. He was right out of college. And he said, I heard you're looking for a ride, Mr. Green. I can take you there. We're going the same day, same time, and I can bring you home. I said, that's fine. I said, have you ever been to the plant? He said, no, but I know where it is. I said, okay. So what I did was I, I trusted that he knew what the way. So we're driving. It's supposed to be a three-hour trip. We're like two and a half hours into the trip. And I had been on this trip before, and I didn't see anything that I knew. And we're like three hours and a half into a three-hour trip. And I said to him, are you lost? He said, yes, how did you know? I said, well, we were driving, and when we started the trip, the moon was in front of us. 
And then about an hour ago, the moon was behind us. And about a half an hour ago, the moon was to the right of us. And right now, it's to the left of us. <laughs> so I have no idea where we are on the map, but I feel like we're driving in a circle. <laughs> he goes, yeah, I'm really lost. So we pulled off, and this was before GPS. Um, and we got a map, believe it or not, one of those ones you fold. <laughs> Some of the young people are like, what do you mean a map you fold? So, but got a map out and we realized we were an hour, we had taken a wrong turn and we were probably an hour and a half away from our destination. And it took us like five and a half hours to go on a three hour trip. We were lost. But we can trust Jesus is our spiritual way. He's like, if you follow me, you will get to where you're going. You, you will, I will guide you as you follow me and as you are my disciple, I will guide you to, to the way you should go because I am the way. I am the truth. I think a lot of times we have so much turmoil because we look at things that are going around us instead of looking at the person of Jesus Christ and following and trusting Him. We always have to say to ourselves, I can trust Him. The wicked one will come in and say, you know, can you really trust Him? Does he... Does, does he really care about you? Do you ever hear those voices? Does he really care about you? Is, is he showing you the right way? Is there really a place for you? And the answer to all those questions is yes. In Christ, his promises, the answer to all his promises are yes, yes, and yes. Always. If Jesus promised it, the answer is yes. And we can trust that He is the way. So not only does He prepare a place for us that we can trust Him, provide the way in following Him, He reveals to us in, chat, in verse 7 something amazing. John chapter 14, verse 7. As you can see, he's, he's, he's dealing, he's telling them all these things that can help them with turmoil. Verse 7, he says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. In verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father? And the Father in me, the words that I speak to you, I do speak on my, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He begins to expand the topic of the Father. And this becomes some of the most intimate teaching Jesus reveals to us. He says, yes, you can trust me. I am the way. I've prepared this place for you. I prepared a great place for you. And I will come again. All these things should be lifting our hearts when we focus on these things. But then he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is in me and I am in the Father. Because of time today, 
I can't go into every single verse, but as John chapter 14, 15, and 16 unfolds, you see a continuation, a continuation of this teaching about the Father. In fact, in later verses, Jesus says, in, in the same teaching time, I'm not going out of the same teaching time, in the same teaching time, he says, the Father is in me, and I am in the Father, and I, I, I will be in you, and we will be in you. And the Father and the Son, we will make our abode, our home in you. So not only is he preparing a place for us in heaven one day, he, is, he has indwelt us. He has made a place in us where the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, where Jesus and where the Father reside. And he said, I, we will make our home in you. We will abide with you. We will stay with you. And in the same passage of Scripture, in verses later, he said, and we will never, never, ever, ever, leave you that's what he says we will never leave you so no matter what you feel no matter how bad it may be no matter what your circumstances might be if you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, the Father has made His abode or His home in you. Jesus, I will tell you, continues on with many more things. He'll talk about the peace that we get from the Holy Spirit. And that He is going to send the Holy Spirit as a comforter. This is all in these teachings in John chapter 14. And I will pray to the Father and He will send you another comforter who will be with you forever. That is in these verses just a few verses away from what we're looking at. And he refers to that spirit as the spirit of peace. So he brings us peace also. And Jesus is just layering on and on and on all these theological truths and real spiritual truths so that when we are struggling we can remind ourselves, I can trust him. He died, he can't, he left heaven and he died for me. He's, he's taken millenniums to prepare a place for me, and it's got to be awesome. And I have a place, I do have a place. I haven't seen it yet, but it's there. And I have the Heavenly Father and Jesus, himself, Jesus and the Holy Spirit indwelling me and the Comforter. And Jesus said those words and in this same passage of Scripture in John chapters 14, 15, and 16 in the same teaching, and I will pray to the Father and He will send you another Comforter. And he talks about how the Comforter will provide us peace. It's, it's interesting in this passage of Scripture, that term Comforter. Uh, if, if you go home and read John chapters 14, 15, and 16, you see this term and Comforter or Helper. But when you drill down to the original Greek word, it's Parakletos, the, the helper. And what that meant was 
It was someone who would come alongside you and help with a difficult task. So when you find yourself in a challenging situation, the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit, He will come alongside you and help you with a difficult task. It's interesting, in a secular job I had, I worked at a safety company. And we bought a company that made bulletproof vests. And someone said, you know, we're buying this company. And I was in management. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And they told me how much it cost and that they make bulletproof vests. And I said, well, what's the name of it? And they say, oh, it's a weird name. I said, oh, it's a weird name? Well, what's weird? Yeah, the company's called Paraclete. Now, I went to seminary. I, Paraclete, Paracletos, that, that's the name for the Holy Spirit. And I thought to myself, isn't that interesting? I don't know who named it. I always try to f- find out who named the company. But literally the person who made this company, who, who created this bulletproof vest that we were selling to the Army and, and Marines during the Iraq War, they named it after the Holy Spirit. And when think about it, when you, when you think about it, a vest does not a vest wrap around you, protect you, keep you safe. And I thought to myself, wow, someone really thought about that. And Jesus is telling us that that the comforter, he comes and helps us during these tough times. Now, Imagine if I was out and someone shot me. And after they shot me, I got up. And I walked around. And then they shot me again and I stood up. There's two possibilities. Okay. One, I'm Clark Kent, Superman, and no one knew, right? That's not true. Or I have something wrapped around me, helping me with a hard task. And if I, if things attack our peace and we get up and give praise to God and work through it, and keep our eyes on Him, it comes from His strength and His protection. And that's the peace that no one understands. And it only comes from the indwelling Father and the Spirit and the indwelling Christ and the Holy Spirit acting as our helper in difficult times. Because I don't care how strong you are, if you get shot five, six, seven, eight times, it's going to take you out, right? But if you have the parakletos, then you have this peace that no one else will understand. And, they'll, and the world will be wondering, how, how, how does she keep getting up? How does he keep getting up? It's not our human effort. It's that helper that helps us. So we can trust him. There's this, we, when we're going through difficult times, I always tell myself, I can trust him. I have his spirit. I have the indwelling Father. 
I have Christ with me. Regardless of the place that I am right now in life, there's another place that He has prepared for me. And when we get our eyes on that, we can then give praise during difficult times. Minister in difficult times. Be the husbands and wives and fathers and mothers that we need to be during difficult times. Because Jesus can be trusted. Let's pray. With every head bowed, I, I, I always people to, to I always ask people to examine themselves. I uh, I I cannot look into your heart. I, I just can't. I uh, medical doctors can check our physical bodies, but oftentimes uh, our hearts are. Are our own to examine. We have to look deep. And I ask you to do that today. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to examine is has there been a time in your life where you've trusted Christ? Where you said, you know, I, He is trustworthy and I need to trust Him. Uh, but I've never done that before. If you find yourself in that situation and, and, and you, you want what you've heard in John chapter 14, I just ask you to pray this prayer from your heart to God the Father. Dear God, I trust you. I trust your son Jesus and I believe in his resurrection and I believe that he died for my sin. Forgive me of my sin. And I pray that your spirit would indwell me and save me and have mercy on me. That is the first, that is how, that is the invitation for the Father to intervene into your spiritual life. And you can trust that if you prayed that prayer, he did. For the believers, I, I do realize that most people here today are believers. Uh, they've made that profession of faith. They may, may, may have made it many years ago. Just examine your heart. And is there something there like a hurt or a wound? Or are you going through something really difficult and challenging right now? I just ask you to reach out to the Father. Thank Him for these things. Thank you that it, for His trustworthiness. Thank Him for the fact that He has shown us the way. Thank you for His Spirit, His Comforter. Just use this time to speak to him. Jesus said, this is a house of prayer. If you come to this place and you don't pray, you've, you've missed it. It's the primary thing we do here. Yeah, we worship, and that's we're supposed to, and we have offerings and preaching, and those are all important things and things were to do, but Jesus never referred to his house as a house of preaching or a house of giving or a house of singing. He referred to it um, in the gospel as a house of prayer. Dear God, as your body is praying, I just pray that um, you would bless um, this time, use it, and that you would um, use it to encourage those who might have a troubled heart. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.